Hello, everyone. Ponyo here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of After Dinner Mints. Before we kick things off, I want to encourage everyone watching to join the community of artists and collectors in the Artbox Discord. A link to our Discord can be found in the description of this video. As always, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of our weekly show. And now on, I want to introduce our guest today. We have a generative artist, Daniel Calderon, a.k.a. Dan Dan. Hey, how's it going? Dan, thanks so much for joining me again on After Dinner Mints. How are you doing? I am doing great. Uh, thanks for having me again, too. Uh, I think last time it was, um, must have been more than six months ago. I know. Yeah, I think it was later. one of the first ones. It was episode number oh, two yeah, is what right. Luke just number told two. me. Wow. That's right. Yeah. I want to say so, that was yes. back in like June or July. Yeah, that was a long time ago. But thank you so much for you know, joining us again today. Today, you're going to go over the history of generative art, and then we're kind of jump into a little bit of a, a coding session. So, you know, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Excellent. Um, all right. Well, uh, let's see here. I have a uh, short presentation to share um, where I will talk about um, sort of the, the early history of computer art and uh, how it relates to uh, the generative art that we've all sort of learned to um, love and appreciate uh, today. And um, so I want to start off with just um, saying that most of the information I'm going to present here uh, comes from a, a paper uh, called Visual Intelligence uh, written by Frank Dietrich in 1986. But it still holds true. It's still very relevant today. So uh, it was published in the journal Leonardo, which is a very well-known um, computer journal at uh, MIT. So um, I'm just going to jump right in here. So uh, first moment sort of with uh, computer arts is uh, 1965. Uh, we have uh, the, the first exhibition ever. Uh, of artwork created by computers. And um, this is in New York City, uh, Howard Weiss Gallery. And it was an exhibition not put on by artists, but rather by scientists. And that's sort of a theme that is uh, reoccurring here when you compare uh, generative art history with um, just traditional arts. Uh, so um, these are mostly just scientists that are uh, computer science uh, engineers that have uh, access to the, you know the, these computers and these uh, facilities and are able to um, sort of explore the visual output of, uh, of code-based processes before most artists were able to do it. And so um, here in this picture we're seeing an exhibition, um, that very first exhibition, and you see uh, the works here by <clears throat> um, Michael Knoll and uh, Bella Jules. And here's a couple of different shots. Uh, you can see some of these works are very much like the kind of stuff that we're seeing, uh, you know, today in, in generative art. And it's, it's a really lovely uh, thing to, to kind of see that resemblance. Um, so likewise, uh, in... Uh, in Germany, there was also another exhibition, 1965 as well, and that was with George Nies and Frieder Naki. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of photographs of that exhibition, so you just have to kind of go by the, uh, the, the <laughs> written documentation of it. Was it well um, received at all? Do you know, like, were, were, what was the the vibe from you know people attending? Yeah, um, the the critique I think was rather harsh. Yeah, um, most I can people were. Yeah, they, they were either frightened by the prospect of a computer uh, being able to create art, or they were um, uh, just very doubtful that a computer could ever achieve what you know a human is capable to achieve, mm -hmm. uh, especially in terms of like sensitivity to subject matter or to you know relationship between human and and life. Uh, so a lot of the critique was not very good, and people were doubtful. But uh, but what's important is that those 
you know, those artists persevered and they continued exploring uh, regardless of what others thought. Definitely. So in this picture here, we have Bell Labs in New Jersey, and this is um, pretty much the one of the earliest hotbeds for the development of computer graphics. Uh, many scientists studied there. There's a um, high concentration of PhDs uh, basically exploring visual arts with computers. Um, and some of the notable people were Lillian Schwartz, Manfred Schroeder, Ken Knowlton, Lean Harmon, and uh, Frank Sinden. And these are um, some of the artists that some of them are still alive today and uh, still producing work. And likewise, in Germany, it was a similar place. And this was the um, Technical University in Stuttgart in Germany. And this is where Frieder Naki uh, studied. And um, the director of this place was Max Bensi, who was a philosopher. And uh, that philosopher is the guy that coined the terms artificial arts and generative aesthetics. Uh, so this is, uh, once again, like in the 1960s. Um, but not long after, there was an exhibition in London. And this exhibition was titled Cer Cybernetic Serendipity. And here on the right-hand side, you can see uh, Heisa Reichart, who is the curator for the exhibition. And this exhibition um, basically represents some of the best overviews of um, the approaches that were emerging in terms of computers and art. So it's sort of like a, a, all of the, not all of, but many of the, the, the artists and scientists that were exploring these concepts were sort of brought into this exhibition and put on display publicly um, questioning the relationships between you know art and computers and the viewer and the artists um, so this exhibition was pretty well documented and um, here is the exhibition catalog which is still available uh, today as a reproduction you can buy it in its full entirety and read oh, it cool. and yeah it's a great uh, book to have in your collection um, but what's really important about this exhibition is that it attracted more artists to the field. Um, same year, this is uh, 1968, um, same year uh, we have this exhibition here in Brooklyn, New York called Some More Beginnings. Um, here in the background, you can see uh, Kenneth, Nol Kenneth Knowlton's uh, reclining mood, and, um, which we'll, we'll look at later, uh, which is also a very well-known well uh, early graphic uh, work of art. And then here, just uh, two years later, 1970, we have another exhibition uh, in the Jewish Museum in New York City called, uh, this exhibition was called Software. You can see here uh, this sort of gantry and uh, this machine that you can, you know, I'm not too familiar with the work, but I can imagine this thing's going back and forth and mm -hmm. picking up blocks and uh, just doing stuff that wouldn't feel too out of place today. Uh, there was just very early. Um, okay, so, um, uh, so okay, so looking here at some of the artists um, that were involved early on. This is uh, Charles Suri, and he's an American artist uh, from Ohio State, where he teaches. Um, and this ex this uh, work of art here is called Sine Wave Man, and this is an early work um, that takes the artist's drawing, digitizes it, converts it into a series of curves, and then uh, extrapolates those curves into a variety of different similar curves, basically using sine waves. And so this, uh, this is a notable work of art because it won a competition. And um, it, Charles Suri, I say Suri, I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, but I'm going with it. Um, this uh, artist was, uh, uh, he was really interested in the computer's ability to allow the artist to be a powerful creator. Um, he was uh, also, he'd also directed many different programming languages. He is one of the early artists that use representative images. So like images of people instead of just abstract you know, shapes and, um, and lines. 
And uh, that was that was pretty rare, and it still is somewhat rare uh, today when, in terms of generative art. Uh, here's another one of his examples. And so he created this algorithm that takes one face and then another face and then uh, sort of uh, morphs them together in this abstract way. And here in the middle, you can kind of see that uh, things just get very uh, kind of, you know, scribbled or, or lost. I would love to see the code on something like that, to just see how, you know, something like back then kind of stacks up to, some, you know, some code today. That's, you know, mm -hmm. some projects that we're seeing on our blocks. I think it would be be really cool to see. But yeah, that's such a beautiful piece right there. Absolutely. Um, here's a really nice quote that I have for him. It says, uh, I can use a well-known physical law as a point of departure. And then quite arbitrarily, I can change the numerical values, which essentially changes the reality. I can have light travel five times faster than the speed of light. And in a sense, put myself in a position of creating my own personal science fiction. Just kind of shows that he's thinking not just of code, but he's thinking that he can he can create things that don't ascribe to the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting point. Yeah. Um, this artist is really interesting here, Robert Mallory. So he is uh, is actually a sculptor who began using computers very early on to create um, works of art. And uh, here in this case, he used an algorithm that created a shape and then sliced that shape into various sections. And then he, uh, he would take the output of the machine and use it to construct the objects. So here we're seeing a relationship between the physical and the digital. Um, and he sort of saw uh, creative coding and just computer-based art as an accelerator for high-speed high speed visual thinking. Um, and I have this really great quote by him. Uh, referred to as, he referred to the computer as a tool for enhancing the on-the-spot creative power and productivity of the artist by accelerating and telescoping the creative process and by making available to its uh, user a multitude of design options that otherwise might not occur to him and her. So they're seeing these algorithms as like expanding their um, abilities, mm -hmm. you know, and that's um, something that just hadn't been done before. Yeah, they had this vision also that just, you know, light years from from anyone else at that time. Absolutely. Um, here's a couple of his um, uh, plotted works, which are sort of like concentric um, shapes. Uh, just executed really beautifully. Uh, you know, plotters were the thing back then. That's that was one of their major output devices. But they also had CRT displays, and uh, eventually, uh, uh, some people would actually just take photographs of the displays, and that would be their output. But for the most part, plotters dominated. And how big um, do you think these plotters were? You know, in relation to how they are today, they seem pretty compact today. Yeah, um, there were some that were. You know, they look like maybe they're the size of a small table. Mm -hmm. um, some of the plotters we're seeing today have um, basically an X and a Y axis that actually travels across the page, whereas the plotters uh, from the past were more like a uh, like a desktop printer where mm -hmm. the paper would move on one axis and uh, the pen would move on the other. And so they were able to um, to create works that were not just uh, larger than what we're, we, we, you know, your typical uh, desktop plotter, but also longer. And so a lot of the works uh, kind of lived on these longer sheets. Um, so here is Vera Molnar. She is probably one of the more most famous uh, generative artists um, because she was a very early uh, explorer of this uh, skill. And not only that, but she co-founded a uh, Grav, which G -R G -A -R -G -R -A -V, which is the um, Group de Research des Arts Visuelles, which is a uh, you know, uh, visual art research group uh, in Paris. And she took that, uh, uh, the lead from Victor Vassarelli, who was a very famous painter at the time. Um, he painted uh, basically um, highly mathematical, 
uh, op art, uh, optical illusion art type of uh, works. And, um, and he had these ideas that were like, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's figure out a way to take a painting and turn it into numbers so that somebody halfway across the world can take those numbers and turn it back into a painting. So it's sort of like, you know, he had the ideas of algorithms, but without the skills or the uh, techniques or the tools to actually execute those ideas. But uh, so uh, Mer Vera Molnar was uh, a friend of his and um, they sort of, you know, exchanged ideas and she started this, she co-founded this research group with a few other artists. Um, she was interested in uh, creating combinations of forms that have never been seen. So this is uh, a really famous work here with the um, squares inside the squares inside the squares. And um, one of the ways that she worked was she would um, she would use the computer before actually making the physical work. So she would use the computer to iterate over designs and possibilities to settle into a very particular uh, aesthetic or a very particular look that she was satisfied satisfied with, and then she would use that to produce the physical work, mm. which um, is a really interesting. Uh, concept today because we're sort of working opposite and you know, we're sketching on paper and then going into the computer and then turning it into a digital work. Um, if you replace the word random with intuition, there you have it. With intuition, suddenly you say, now what if I used a curve instead of a straight line and what sort of curve? And then you try it. That's intuition. Randomness does the same thing. Mm -hmm. So these Very artists clever. are yeah, she, she was exploring randomness along with uh, most of these, most of the others. Um, but randomness became sort of like this uh, you know, uh, topic to think about and uh, explore uh, both philosophically and um, visually. Uh, here's one example of how you know, she sort of starts with uh, this rectilinear set of squares, which even prior to this may have all been perfectly concentric, but then she adds know curves and then she adds more curves and, and then she adds more randomness and um, she has a whole set of you know whole paper dedicated to ex explaining how um, you know how much is how much is too far mm -hmm. and uh, at, at some point it becomes uh, un, unvisually pleasing you know non-visually pleasing and so uh, it's about using iteration using randomness and using the computer to help find that sort of that zone where things are visually pleasing. Mm -hmm. um, so here is one of the physical works that she produced from an edition, a digital edition similar to this. And are, are th these yeah. are both printed, right? Those aren't, you know, this one's definitely not pen plotter, I would, I would think. Oh, definitely not. Yeah, no, this okay. is actually paint <laughs> on canvas. Got it. Mm -hmm. Where some of these other ones are uh, pen plots. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason that they're, these are pen plots is because um, Back then, they, they may not have necessarily had the monitor to see the results. And so in order to see the results of their code, they had yeah, to they pen just, plot it. Got it. Yeah, they had to wait for the pen plot to complete and be like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can uh, you know add some more randomness or change these lines. And I'm sure it took a while also. I'm sure you know, today's oh, yeah. pen plotter is a lot quicker, whereas, you know, I don't know, sure. did, was it like hours or days even? There's, um, I think most of them could be done within minutes, but there are some accounts okay. that I've read that people say, you know, it, it could take hours. Um, you know, artists like Ver Verosco, uh, he would let his run for days. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so there's very, it's, it's very much a spectrum of time. Mm -hmm. um, this artist here, Hiroshi Kawano, he is a very early computer artist, if not one of the earliest uh, Japanese. Um, for, uh, he's um, he he started producing uh, digital, or I'm sorry, computer code-based works from as early as 1959, which is oh, wow. uh, early, about five years earlier than some of the other ones we've looked at already. Um, so he sort of stated that um, humans. Uh, uh, human standards of aesthetics, they're not necessarily applicable to art, uh, computer art. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a different kind of thing here that we're dealing with. And what we understand to be beauty in, in traditional paintings does not necessarily apply to like the computer arts. Um, and so he sort of explained it as that the, the artist's role when dealing with 
computer arts is to teach the computer how to make the art using algorithms. But then at that point, the computer is the artist. And so it sort of, you know, shifts um, the, uh, the artistic role from the artist to the computer. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, and so artists, which are, you know, while we're programming, uh, we're sort of uh, these meta artists. We sort of live in between these both worlds of, um, you know, producer and also, um, you know, viewer. Got it. No, that so, makes sense. Yeah, and, and so here's a couple of those longer uh, printouts here, which I think are just beautiful. Yeah. Um, this 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 vertical format, um, and here's another one of his works, kind of close up. And uh, some of these artists did play with color, and um, usually color would be a product of um, plotting out something on paper and then coming in by hand and filling it in with color. Okay, you did just like paint it by hand with like a, mm -hmm. like a exactly, pen, I guess. yeah, or paint. Exactly, and I'm just I'm just noticing this right now, but there's like this little square that's not perfectly touching, sharp like, like the, all the others. Yeah, yeah it makes me wonder, you know, like <laughs> can the artist sort of come in after the fact or you know correct mistakes or who knows, right? Like it's just it's art. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then uh, Harold Cohen, he's another well-known artist. And this artist is interesting because he, um, he wanted more than anything to just automate the process of drawing. And he wanted to do it in his own personal style. So like you can kind of see that this, uh, you know, this image here, it's, it's got like a loose gestural stroke that um, it almost looks like it was sketched on paper with a big marker. But really it was sketched by this robot that's in the middle of the page. This is mm. he called it a turtle, and he would control this robot, uh, you know, from by a computer. And um, so the the interesting thing here is that these strokes they're not very uh, g. I mean, they are geometric in some extent, but but they're they're loose and they're sketch sketchy, um, you know. And that's uh, something that he spent years working on. He worked with Stanford University's uh, artificial intel intelligence lab. Um, to create these sorts of algorithms. And he, he would like uh, basically combine some of his hand-drawn sketches with some of, uh, you know, digitize them and put them into this bank of, of information that this robot could pull from to create these uh, other similar works in his style. Um, and uh, here's another example of, uh, this is more like a table-sized plot. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, just a, a normal size print. Uh, but you can kind of see that that similar style is happening here. And uh, he would come in afterwards and color them with watercolors. So uh, it's, yeah. again, that relationship between the human and the machine. And this artist, Harold Cohen, is an example of a very harmonic relationship between man and machine. Do you think that was um, more like, do you think that was well received then more than just like compute, like art that was created, generated by like a, a computer, you know, when you're saying, you know, they came in and they colored it by hand, do you think that was, you know, well received, like better received, I guess, from the public? I, I think, I mean, I would imagine that it would be, but it's still, um, I, I think that it was more a, a product of that color just wasn't available on mm -hmm. these machines yeah. in terms of plots. And artists have, you know, they're coming from a background that's just rich in color. I mean, talking about cubism and impressionism and, um, you know, things like that. And, and so there, there's a, probably a, a, a feeling in these artists. I'm just you know, speculating here, but there's a feeling in these artists that are, you know, they're thinking, well, like, how, how can I bring color into this, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, at every absolutely. step of the way. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and so this you know this is a common way to do it you know the, the plot lays down lines and then the artist comes in and, and does his traditional role and brings the color in yeah i think that's great um manfred moore is, is another artist um he was a self he was self-taught in computer science and um he was um <clears throat> more interested in um, filling the void between the, the lack of um, some of the elements that computers would 
produced. So, for example, just like we were talking about with Harold Cohen and, and, the, and coloring in, because there, the, the, there was no color, right? Well, uh, Manfred Moore, instead of using color to fill that void of the things that were missing, he used the concept, so conceptualism. Um, so he sort of said that uh, crude computer graphics, they needed to be offset by something like a strong concept. And, um, and so what he did is, is he began thinking about geometry and uh, lines and shapes um, and the cube. Mm -hmm. So one of his uh, sort of uh, recognizable images is, uh, is a combination of lines that can be uh, combined, that can be um, combined in different ways to produce cubes. And um, basically presented a few elements that could be explored extensively, right? So in this case, um, he's using just very simple short line segments. And he's looking at all the different ways that these things can be combined using a very simple set of rules mm -hmm. into uh, more complete, more complex shapes, which that shape is eventually the cube. Um, but that was sort of his, uh, you know, his, his area of interest. Um, here's another example. So uh, here you have what looks like a deconstructed cube. So like looking at his other work, you probably can imagine this is some sort of cube element, but deconstructed in some interesting way. Um, and here's a, a nice quote from him. The paradox of my generative work is that form wise, it is minimalist and content wise, it was maximalist. So he's sort of relying on content as being the thing that carries all the weight here. Got it, yeah. Great. Um, here's one of my favorite works by him. Uh, this is basically, um, he, he basically worked in subclusters. So he would combine a whole bunch of these uh, different generative uh, variations of this cube into this very large wow. grid. And I don't know, it, it, hopefully you guys can see, but these are actually a uh, little tiny uh, cubes in the middle. Yeah, so, so each one is a little bit different than the one next to it. And there's probably hundreds exactly. on there. Yeah, hundreds. Uh, here's a, a, another view of that oh, in wow. the middle. So you can see that every single one is different and the slight variations, like, you know, this one and this one are very, very similar, but there's a slight variation. and. Mm -hmm. He would compose these works where, um, you know, it, it would just put it all together in a very interesting, visually appealing way. That's very cool. That's awesome. That's a great piece. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is Kenneth Knowlton. Um, this is also a very, uh, very important artist in the uh, computer art history. Uh, he was a researcher at Bell Labs, um, and he's well known for creating this image of a reclining mood. Uh, together with uh, Leon Harmon, who's uh, another uh, computer scientist at Bell Labs. Um, they were interested in devising automatic digitizing methods for images. So like, how do you take a photograph and turn it into, you know, like a, an image, right? Essentially, this is a time when computers were very not able to work with, with photos. And, um, and so they, they did it by uh, using elect uh, scanning an image using, um, like values, assigning values. I can't remember if it was like a, a magnetic scan of some kind, mm -hmm. um, but um, they were able to derive the values of the image. And then in order to reproduce the image, they, uh, they used different uh, symbols that were traditionally used in uh, like electronic schematics. And so if you look up close, all you see is a whole bunch of symbols, but if you look far away, then you, you get the, yeah. the full image. That's really cool. Um, so this is like probably, if not the earliest example of uh, image processing and possibly the earliest example of a digital uh, nude, which is uh, at a time when things were not very figurative, you know, this is a, a big step. Um, he also said that artists are illogical, intuitive, and impulsive, and that they need programmers who are constrained, logical, and precise as translators to the computer. And so he spent a lot of his time working on programming languages that would make it easier for artists to uh, be able to, to express through computers. <clears throat> yeah, I gotta imagine that a piece like that has to take a significant amount of time to, you know, obviously oh, for the right, first right. one, you know, to kind of just 
each piece, you know, is a symbol. I feel like that's, mm-hmm. yeah, it's going to take a lot of time to kind of put that all together. Yeah. And, uh, pr- you know, presumably they would, they use algorithms to do that. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, I know that this was exhibited at that exhibition in uh, New York, uh, but they also had another one that was a, a, a huge gargoyle, like looking over a building that was just really beautiful. And um, also, exi- I think it was uh, published on, uh, I think in Time Magazine, and it got a lot of attention. And oh, okay. it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, the the lab where he was, at, I think Bell Labs at the time, um, they didn't want anything to do with this nude image. They sort of saw it as pornographic or like distancing themselves from it. But yeah. then as soon as Time Magazine or some other huge publication came and said, oh my gosh, this is incredible. We're going to put this on our magazine. <laughs> the lab was like, oh yeah, that's that's our guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then it's like, okay, it's fine then. It's, it's, it's not yeah, a problem. Exactly. I'm actually so, curious, um, are there, you know, are there museums or gallery spaces that have like, they, they talk about the, the history of generative art. You know, is that, I, I don't know. I feel like, you know, I hear about some museums here and there that have, you know, a couple mm-hmm. pieces, but is there like a, you know, quintessential museum where it's like, this is the spot to go to if you want to, you know, if you want to like see yeah. some of these pieces up close? Um, there may be some places out there, um, but not that I'm too familiar with, at least not a dedicated history of generative art. Mm-hmm. I, you know there's this history of computers museums out there there's yeah. uh, plenty of art museums out there but not necessarily one that and maybe i, I just haven't seen it or haven't been exposed to it but, yeah um not that i know of well so. if there hasn't I, been one you know created or done really well then i have a feeling that you mm-hmm. know in the, in the future there will be there's collections you know for example the uh ann and michael spalter collection which is oh yeah yeah probably the biggest Some of, the be- yeah. of generative art in the world. Um, and that's visible pretty much anywhere in the world. It's all online and mm-hmm. it's, uh, there's so much information there. That's where most of these pictures come from. Um, so yeah, there's, there's stuff out there like that. Uh, just uh, not, not a, you know, a brick and mortar location that I'm too familiar with. Got it. Okay. Uh, oh yeah. So here's a close up of the electrical signals. Oh, wow. see. It's basically ASCII art or, uh, you know, uh, people still kind of play with this today. Um, Frieder Naki, right? Like one of the, probably one of the, another one of the best known generative artists. Um, he wrote his own programming language uh, called Compart ER56. And um, he used that programming language that he wrote himself uh, to produce more than 100 drawings. Um, he sort of thought of a computer as a universal picture generator. So a device that just you know, produces pictures infinitely. And um, he was well aware that a computer was able to, was capable of creating every possible picture, you know, in, in the universe, if you think about it like that, right? Like just using pixels and color. And technically that that makes sense, right? Like my monitor could essentially display any single image in the world, but it's just a matter of getting the right combination of pixels on in the right positions on the screen. So he's very, we- very, very well aware of that, and um, and so he used uh, random numbers to sort of break that break the predictability of the computer. And in this case, he made various. Uh, uh, compositions of this image just using random numbers like for example one of them the the lines may be breaking over here and the circles may be over there yeah. and so he he was very um very much kind of what we're doing today and uh with our blocks it's uh, a generative addition so to speak and uh and i think that's a, a very uh sort of important artist in the in the line of things especially in regards to what we do with art blocks cool. um Here's another one of his works. This is, you can see he's using color, but yeah. this is the plotter pen. Now has different color tips on it. Um, and then here is, and we're almost done, by the way. So just a couple more. Uh, this is George. Uh, I say George Nice, but maybe it's Georg Nice. Yeah. Um, he was interested in visual complexity and uh, connection with the chance determination reaction. So basically, he's um, interested in chance. And he programmed a computer 
to generate random numbers at the time that was not something that was just available out of the box. And so he had to write his own algorithms to do that. And in this case, this is uh, it's probably one of the earliest dimensional sculptural sort of works in the generative art worlds where he, um, he, pro he, he programmed a number to spit out a whole bunch of random numbers. And then he tied those to uh, 3D rectangular coordinates and then used a, uh, a, 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 a mill of some kind to uh, come in and route all of these different squares at different depths. That's cool. And there's looks like there's some shadows, um, or it yeah. almost looks like there's some shadows to some of those squares. Totally, totally. This is milled, so I, I do believe that may be dimensionality we're oh, looking okay. at. Yeah, that's a really cool piece. Um. And then let's see here, we have uh, Michael Knoll. So here we are back at the beginning with uh, when that, that very first exhibition ever, mm -hmm. uh, this artist was interested in uh, recreating works by uh, traditional artists like Piet Mondrian. And he um, actually uh, recreated a Mondrian using code and, and then showed it to a hundred different people um, alongside the real Mondrian that he copied. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the, the subject's preference was for the digital recreation of it <laughs> over <great>. the original. <laughs> so I'm not sure what that reveals, but that was yeah. an interesting experiment. And you know, some of these guys were scientists, so they were thinking about these things scientifically. And um, here's a really beautiful uh, one called uh, <clears throat> uh, Currents. And it's just repetitive patterns. Uh, he's got a quote here. Uh, repetitive patterns. Uh, basically, he's saying that repetitive patterns can be uh, simply explained using math terms, you know. And so he stuck with uh, repetition a lot. That's cool. It looks like a kind of a wave. Yeah, and um, something that most likely the op artists were also exploring at the time. I know that he did try to recreate some paintings from the op art movement. Um, and then uh, last but not least is Peter Stryken. And this artist, um, he took a course in electronic music at the time because oh. music departments, believe it or not, were uh, had computers before the art studios. And um, so some of the artists had to go there to, to learn about computers. And he was actually, uh, this is a black and white image, but he was actually focused on pure color like shortly after. Um, he sort of didn't really care too much about the abstract form and said that, you know, color was more important. And uh, here's a quote by him saying, form is an easier conceptual representation and repetition than color. Form can almost always be associated with a form that is already known. How easy it is to connect abstract forms to reality. This is just like a cloud. That is like a snake. These like flowers. Form is then regarded as, as something in itself where recognition as, is as important as seeing. Um, and then this is sort of the work he ended up producing later. Uh, actually, he, a variety of very beautiful, colorful uh, compositions, but uh, this is uh, very typical of his. Um, and again, these are plotted and then colored in by hand. So um, that relationship of you know machine and artist and um, that's uh, that's what I got. That's great. And do you find that you know you still see artists today? Of, you know, you're talking about like pen plotting, where you know artists go in afterwards and you know kind of paint or color in mm -hmm. afterwards. Is that something that's still? Absolutely. Um, I'm pretty sure Tyler Hobbs has uh, explored yeah. that, and if not, continues to. Um, it's 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 a way to overcome you know the the the, the lack of color and mm -hmm. plots and things like that so um you know of course nowadays we have like full color printers that can <laughs> print yeah it can even they can even print like neon colors and whites and you know things like that not just rgbs and uh, cmyk but um so every color of the spectrum is pretty much possible but it's just there's something about the the putting the pen to the paper with the plotter that is just um, hard to replicate and uh, it's you know so definitely yeah I, yeah I think it's also just great to see you know artists 
you know, painting on top of it because they're all going to be unique. You know, they're not all going to look the same because, Mm -hmm. you know, getting that exactness is not going to be as easy as, you know, a computer kind of doing that for you. Exactly. So there's, there's that uh, uniqueness that's always going to be present. So totally. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for talking to us a little bit about, you know, the history of generative art. I think it's super important for everyone you know, as we're in this space in art blocks, you know, a lot of us, you know, I- I've just learned about art blocks since January. I still have a lot to learn. I think it's just so great to, for all of us to kind of enrich ourselves with, you know, the history and the how, you know, how things have evolved over time. I think that's just super important. So thank you for doing mm-hmm. that. Um, totally. Well, yeah. So, you know, the next portion of the after dinner mints, I know you want to talk a little bit about, uh, or we're going to go through a little bit of a coding session, which I'm really looking forward to. But I also wanted to talk about, uh, you know, can you talk to us about this generative art workshop that was held in East Palo Alto? You did this with, uh, you know, Jake or Purple Hat, as a lot of people know, uh, mm-hmm. back in October. Can you talk to us a little bit about this project? Definitely. So that was um, just an, an incredible um, project, uh, a vision by... Um, from James Higa, who uh, runs the Philanthropic Venture Fund. And um, he, he sort of helped bring this all together. And um, it was a, a really awesome experience for me as, a, as an artist, but also as an educator, um, just being able to, uh, to provide resources or, or just, just lessons and, and inspiration to uh, to children who and not just children there's also adults in the class but uh, to to students who um, who wouldn't have this opportunity otherwise mm-hmm. you know like this the East Palo Alto they they're right next to Silicon Valley and to think that um, they're they're Silicon Valley's huge success um, is just right next door and they and they don't always get the opportunity to uh, to be involved with that. Um, so, you know, what is you know, sort of going through my mind is that, um, that communities like East Palo Alto, they're, they're the, the last ones to ever, uh, you know, get access to this stuff. And so how can, you know, we, how can I bring uh, what I can deliver uh, straight to them? And, and I think that's very much uh, the sort of thought behind this um, with James Higa and um, Art Blocks and uh, Save Art Space, they were also involved. Um, and so the, the, the workshop was, uh, was just incredibly uh, fulfilling in that regard. Um, it was great working with these students. They were uh, energetic. They, uh, they sort of get it. Um, they're quick to learn. Uh, you know, I've, I've taught some older college students before, and I can say that uh, you know, so, some of these kids are much faster learners. Um, they are creative. They, they were able to you know, put together these images and, and these compositions real, real quickly and easily using these tools. And, um, and uh, it was just a wonderful opportunity. Uh, Jake was there, and uh, he if Jake was sort of like my right hand man, he went around and made sure that every student was kind of up to speed and um, uh, just was, you know, absolutely essential to have him there and, and, and helping with that. Um, and uh, it was just a wonderful experience just overall. I mean, I'm excited to see the billboards. The billboards will be released in, uh, I think, January. And, yeah, uh, January 3rd. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, yeah, so for people that don't know, uh, the students that took this this art workshop held by Dan and, and you know helped with Jake, uh, they created some outputs and they're going to be on billboards side by side with an actual piece um, from an art blocks artist. So those will go up. There are going to be twenty of them. They're going to be hitting the San Francisco area. So not just in San Francisco, but like East Palo Alto, mm-hmm. that entire like corridor um, just outside of San Francisco. But yeah, starting January third, there will be about. There will be 20 pieces, 20 billboards out there. And, you know, we're going to have a professional photographer going out there, taking photos of each billboard. And, yeah, we're really looking forward to sharing them with the community and, you know, to see all the hard work that, you know, Dan, Jake, 
uh, you know, James, a.k.a. Uh, Karate Kid on, on Discord and, you know, Save Art Space. Yeah, it's just been a very, like, really cool collaborative project. And, you know, just to see these kids, uh, you know, that are underserved, you know, they don't have these opportunities, you know, it's for for you guys to go out there and to, and to put this together, I think is just, you know, fantastic. And hopefully it's something that I think we can do in, in other cities around, you know, the States or even abroad, you know, I think this could be easily done, you know, all over the world and to showcase, um, yeah, just this art that these kids have helped put together. And I think it would be really, really cool one day to have these kids, you know, check out their art, or check out the outputs on the billboard and then, you know, dream big one day and be like, you know what, one day I'm going to, you know, release a project on art blocks. I think that mm-hmm. would be the biggest like end goal um, of this entire project. And I, I think it will happen. You know, I think some of these kids will be really interested and I think it's just great to, for y'all to get out there. So thank you so much for, for doing that. And yeah, it's really appreciative to the community. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. It was, it was a, a wonderful opportunity and I, I look forward to more opportunities like that. Excellent. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I think we'll be hopefully doing some more of these in 2022. And yeah, we'll look forward to it. But yeah, I think having these billboards up in the top of the year, I think will be a great way to kick off uh, the new year. So looking forward to that. It's great. Well, I know we have uh, this little bit of this coding session. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk this a little, a little bit about what we're going to be doing? Sure. I, ha- sure. I so... have my, <laughs> yeah, I have my website. If you want to talk a little bit about, you know, the online editor and everything. Great. So, um, so what we're going to do here, this is a, basically a, a short um, little coding lesson for geared for never ever coders. So this is for somebody who's never coded before, um, is looking to get involved, but doesn't know how, doesn't know where to start. Um, and it's sort of just, it's just meant to sort of get things going. Um, and what we're using is what's called the P5 editor. Um, it's this um, <clears throat> uh, page here. And this is an online tool. It's completely free. We're using um, JavaScript, which is the language of the web, basically what uh, our blocks projects use as well. And uh, the library we're using is called p5.js. And it's a library that was um, developed uh, sort of as a web version of the famous processing library that was designed by uh, Ben Fry and Casey Reyes. And um, this web editor is completely free. Um, you can make an account or you can not make an account. It's up to you. Um, but uh, it basically, it has this window on the left-hand side, which is where the code gets written, and then a play button up here uh, to see the results, and the results will be uh, shown here on the right hand side. So for example, if I were to just press play right now, you can see that I am presented with my canvas. This is my canvas. This is where the artwork gets created. Um, and you can see that uh, the canvas has, uh, is the size is 400 by 400. So that's uh, 400 wide by 400 pixels tall. And if I were to change that to let's say 500 by 400, you can see that the canvas now adapts and changes to that size. Mm-hmm. So um, I think what's uh, what we should do here is uh, maybe you can sort of uh, follow along and I'll, I'll sort of tell you uh, what we're going to write and what it's going to do. And um, uh, I can see your screen, you can see my screen. And yep. if you're following along, then uh, you can sort of see uh, what, what the process of making a creative uh, algorithmic artwork looks like. And just to give everyone a heads up, it's uh, editor.p5js.org is the website. Absolutely. And then also yeah. what I have on my screen, which is the one that's like right below over here, if you hit, you know, file and new, this is like the default what comes up. I, I didn't like already program oh, right. this code already. So it's not like I'm a, this is actually my first time doing this. So I'm really excited. Great. <laughs> um, all right. So we have on the left, we have two functions. We have the setup function and we have the draw function. And the setup function is uh, where we're gonna start right now. So what I would, uh, first thing we should do is let's let's write some text to the screen. So after the create canvas 400 comma 400, uh, on the next line, we wanna write the word text, and then we wanna open and close instead of parentheses. 
And then using quotation marks, we're going to write the word hello. Just like that. Okay. Follow, followed by a comma. And let's write this at the position 100, comma 100. So I'm basically saying I want this at the position 100 on the x axis and 100 on the y axis. Okay. Okay. And once you have that, go ahead and press play. And you'll see that it may, maybe it flashed for a second. And what we need to do is uh, just to get this working, we need to get rid of this background. So I want you to just uh, okay. uh, uh, put your mouse on this line that says background. And uh, you can just uh, hit command uh, forward slash or control forward slash. It should uh, comment it out so it won't, it won't actually do anything down there. Got it. Oh, yeah. I see it really small. Okay, so now you see the I word hello, right? Yeah. Excellent. So the next thing we want to do is let's make this a little bit bigger. So um, to do that, we're going to use another function. And uh, this function goes before the first one. So here, after create canvas, go ahead and press enter again. And we're going to write the function called uh, text size. Now, if you look closely, text is lowercase, but S on size is capital. So um, this is sort of the convention for uh, writing functions in JavaScript. Okay. <clears throat> so inside that text size function, let's give it a size of 100. So inside those parentheses, you can write the, the value 100. And go ahead and press play again, and now it should be much bigger. Yep. So Basically, what we're doing is we're using these uh, these predetermined functions that are the part of P5.js, and we're using them to uh, sort of construct uh, a, an image on the right-hand side. Now, at the end of each line, there should be this thing called a semicolon, and that basically tells the software, okay, this line is done. Move on to the next line. So, um, okay, so let's see. The next thing we're going to do is let's write the word world. So. After line four, after uh, the hello, let's do another one, another text function. Inside there, we're going to write the word world. So make sure that the word world is in parentheses and um, also in quotation marks. And let's give this one a position instead of 100, 100. Let's do it at um, 100, 300. Once you have that, There you go. Yeah. Excellent. So the one, so the you 100 have, um, meaning your the text is black. And... Yeah. So 100 meaning the x axis, and then mm -hmm. 300 meaning the y axis. So that's why, it, since it's 300, it basically Absolutely, brought it down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And now text on a computer is going to, uh, or on in JavaScript at least in this library, is going to start at the top left corner of the canvas. So uh, if you put your mouse on the top left corner of your canvas, that's going to be the position zero, zero. And if you move your mouse downwards, that Y axis is increasing mm -hmm. until it gets down to 300. So it's sort of opposite of what we learned in math class where uh, the X value goes upwards. Well, on a computer, it goes downwards right. into the right. Okay. Um, okay, so next up, let's, um, let's use a function to help align our text in the middle of our canvas. And um, since I, I noticed your canvas is uh, dark on the background, so uh, let's go ahead and um, add a background to yours. And I'll do the same with mine. So after the create canvas line, mm -hmm. press enter. And let's just write in background, open and close parentheses. And inside of that function, let's give it the value. Um, let's go with 150. It's a neutral gray. And then should I add a semicolon at the end of it? After Absolutely, the... yeah. Yeah, okay. go ahead and do that after every single one of these uh, these lines that we write. So that's how we terminate the line. Um, so now you'll see that you're, uh, you have a, a, a colored background, and you can see the, the text a little bit clearer. But look how the text is not centered, right? So let's mm -hmm. center that. So after the text size function, press Enter. And let's write text align. Now remember, capital A on the align but everything else is in lowercase. And then inside of this uh, text align function, uh, inside of the parentheses, we're going to write, in all caps, the word center. 
Is it so? It's important to make sure you know if it's capitalized or not capitalized. It's case sensitive. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is uh, it's it's all case sensitive. Uh, so go ahead and press play, and you're gonna see that now things sort of moved over to the left. Yeah. And they're out of the picture. So what that means is that basically the center of this text is at the position 100, 100. So on, on the x-axis. So we need to now move that position over to the middle of the canvas. So what we can yeah. do is we can calculate like half of 400. You know, if this 200. is 400 pixels, we could set it to 200, um, just like this. So go ahead on hello, write the word, uh, write the value 200 for the x-axis. Okay. And we can achieve the same thing by doing it with math. And we can use the, um, the built-in uh, canvas size. So this number is automatically put into a variable called width. So go ahead and write the, the value width, which if we think about it, that, that's just another way to represent the value 400. And width divided by 2, okay. you know, 400 divided by 2 uh, okay. is also 200. Ah, uh, OK. Nice. So we just did that in a, uh, a mathematical way. So now look what happens if we change the size of our canvas on the x-axis to 600. It'll still center it. The bottom one will center because yeah. it's responding to it uh, mathematically, but the top one is hard set on the value 200. The 200 yeah. Spawn. yeah. So let's go back to 400 by 400 and um, <clears throat> continue here. So um, let's, um, let's change the color of the text. So here after text align center, let's go ahead and press enter and say fill. So the fill is how we add color into, uh, into P5.js. And inside the fill, we can set a value between 0 or 100. So if we set it to 100, that's going to be white. So go ahead and type in 100 in the fill function and then press play and it looks great because i said that wrong i'm sorry it's actually <laughs> 255 is the uh the white uh, okay so if i were there to change go. the fill to 255 yeah okay perfect and does it matter like the order because i know you're saying you know after text align add this mm -hmm. add and fill so it's when it's processing everything mm -hmm. like calculating everything it starts from you know line one to two, three, four. So it has to, yes, you know. Exactly. So okay. the order does matter. And it, it starts up at the top and it goes downwards. So for example, if I were to take this fill function and cut it and paste it in between these two, the hello would happen with the nat the default black color. And mm. then the fill would be changed to white. And then the second word world would appear white. Got it. Okay. So it really depends where you put these uh, functions that where what's going to be affected. Um, and let's see here. So we've changed it to white. Now let's change it to an actual color. And what we're going to do is instead of saying 255 in the fill function, we're going to give it three values. Now the first one corresponds to red. Second one corresponds to blue. And the third one corresponds to, uh, I'm sorry, the second one corresponds to green. The, the third one corresponds to blue. So if I say um, red, 255, green, 255, blue, 255, that's all, another way of saying white because they are all maxed out. So mm -hmm. it can only be between 0 and 255. So if I bring down, for example, uh, the middle one, the green value, and I set that to something like 100, well, I'm bringing down the green value and it results in a, uh, a color that's 100% uh, red, uh, a little bit under 50% uh, green, and 100% uh, blue. And so it, that's the magenta. So using these three colors, the RGB, um, we can uh, determine different uh, colors. And so here's an example that I have. Um, and this is just another uh, sketch that I have put together. But um, if you see here, I've got, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I think the doesn't share the different tabs. Okay, well, no worries. Um, RGB, we will um, use these to determine the red, green, and blue values. Um, okay, so the next thing is um, <clears throat> we want to, let's use a random color 
this time instead of a magenta. So in, here in the, in the red of the fill function, mm -hmm. let's do something kind of weird and let's put in a random function like that. So it says random, open and close parentheses. And inside of there, we want, to, we want it to give us a random number between zero comma and 255. So a random number between two, 0 and 255 for the red. For the red, okay. Mm -hmm. And if we press play um, repeatedly. Uh, it'll be like different see, types. Yeah, the red yeah. will be, you know, different outputs from that mm -hmm. red. Every single time it runs, really cool. it determines a random number. So what I like to do is highlight all of that random 0, 255, and then copy and paste it into all three of those color values. And so now every time we press play, it'll be something totally a different. Totally different color, right? And this is based this is the 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 general idea behind um, iterating in a generative artwork is every time you press play, every time uh, the script runs, it, it creates a, a new random output. Oh, that's really cool. So is that similar to how you know, it takes the, you know, when, when we're using art blocks and technology, it takes, you know, the, the hash. Is that similar mm -hmm. where it takes? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so the, the hash is determining, instead of using a random function, the, the hash is determining this value. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a, sort of like a constant value that will always produce the same result. Um, let's highlight all of this stuff here, except for the create canvas function. So just... Uh, all of this stuff down here and cut it and paste it. You can replace the background that we uh, commented out. Cut it and paste it into the draw function. Oh, wow. And <laughs> yeah, so if you press play, you're going to get. I'll uh, have mine on auto refresh. That's why it's going crazy. So I'll, I'll oh, turn. cool. Okay. Um, so now it's, <laughs> it's every time it runs, and if it's too, too flashy, you can, uh, you can stop it. But every single time it runs, it's going to spit out a different color. And then That's we can cool. control the frame rate here in the setup function. We can write in frame rate, so capital R on the frame rate. We can slow it down. Let's set it to something like, uh, like five. Uh, okay. Frame rate is five. This is, just means five frames per second. And now you can see it much slower cycling through. Super and cool. I'm going to explain here in a second why this, um, uh, why it's actually animating as opposed to why isn't it just standing still? Mm -hmm. And uh, here's uh, a really clear way to explain it. Um, by the way, this is this will be the end of this portion, and then we're going to move into the second portion in a moment. Okay. Um, let me just share this with you here. <clears throat> so here's another sketch showing what exactly is happening when we press play. So. Here you see this yellow line that's moving downwards. And what happens when we press play is first the sketch starts in the setup function and that runs once. And then it reads the next line, the next line, the next line. And when it enters the draw function, it sort of goes into a loop. Look how it, instead of, when it gets to the bottom of the sketch, instead of starting at the top, it just starts at the beginning of the draw loop. Uh, okay. And so, what happens when, we, when we're pressing play on these uh, P5 sketches is the script reads everything from the top down, and then it sort of cycles forever inside of this draw loop. It gets stuck in there, right? Yeah. And uh, and that's um, and we use that as a way to uh, create animation. And right here, I have it set to frame rate one, but usually it runs at you know 30 to 60 frames per second. You can kind of see there. I'm going to press play a few times, so you can kind of see it. it starts up here. But then it goes into this draw loop. Yeah, continuously and it gets forever. stuck inside that little area. Yeah, under the function draw. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is the general uh, idea with uh, with uh, these you know most of these sketches that these uh, creative code algorithms is the animation happens in these draw loops. So what you're seeing in your sketch when you press play is it um, the <clears throat> the color changing of the text is happening in the draw loop. And every single time that draw loop runs, it's getting new random numbers for that color. Mm -hmm. 
So um, as far as the frame rate, like the numbers and the numerical value in between the parentheses there, is that like milliseconds or what, what is that? It's uh, frames per second. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. that makes so sense. I, I think <laughs> uh, the maximum is, uh, that this can do is 60. So you can see it goes way faster there. Got it. Um, okay. But it's basically controllable. It's kind of like a, a film, you know, you can set the frame rate. That's very um, cool. Yeah, so let's do something a little bit more exciting now. Okay. Um, so go ahead and go to File New, and you don't need I mean, to worry about. Should I save saving. this though? This is like this is like a piece you, of work that have I have. You um, <laughs> if you have an account, you can yeah, save it. Yeah, I, I have one saved, so maybe I'll. Oh, perfect. So yeah, go ahead and save that. And uh, um, cool. if you don't have an account with uh, the P5 editor, then it won't let you save. So you know uh, that's what the account lets you do. Um. All right, so this was going to be a little bit um, vi- more visually interesting than just Hello World. Um, so let's go ahead and start with uh, a square. So here in the draw function, after the background function, press Enter and say uh, square, just like that. And the square function uses um, three parameters. So parameters are the, the the inputs that we're putting in these functions. So we can we're going to say zero comma zero comma 100. So the x position, the y position of the square, and the size of the square. If you press play, well, my square is in the top left corner. Mm-hmm. And the where we place our square depends on uh, you know that top left corner of the square itself. So now after the square function, go ahead and add a new function called rotate. And inside of this uh, rotate function, we're going to write in frame count. So this is a, uh, a special built-in value. It's a variable. It's constantly changing every time, every frame that runs. Now, if you press play, um, you won't see much happen because we haven't uh, done anything else here yet. So um, <clears throat> let's, um, let me see here. I'm not doing it wrong. I'm forgetting something. Okay, give me one second. No, I, I like this. This is important because you know everyone's gonna make an error here and there, and I think it's important for us to kind of we'll, we'll kind of like figure it out together. You know. <laughs> totally. So, so this is a very common thing. You, yeah. you have something that's not functioning correctly, and uh, you have to figure out what the heck is causing it. Oh, duh. Okay, so I made a mistake. Rotate needs to happen before the square gets drawn. Uh, okay. So let's cut the rotate function and paste it before the square. Okay, there we go. So now the square is oh, rotating wow. wildly <laughs> fast around that corner, right? So what we can do is we can multiply this variable, which is in, this is an increasing number that's increasing very fast. So we need to multiply this by something very small, like 0.01. So you can just say times... 0.01. Okay. And now we press play, and then you'll see it's going to rotate around that corner. Oh, wow. It's like really smooth and, and yeah, yeah it's a nice clean exactly. animation. But it's gone, exactly. though. That's, it like goes off it, the page, I guess. Exactly. It goes oh, off the page. Oh, because it's so, doing okay, a full loop. Mm-hmm. We just can't see it. So it's rotating around the point zero zero on this canvas. And so what we need to do is we need to, A, move the center of the square to the point zero zero. So it rotates around its midpoint. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is we, uh, before we we draw the square, we say, uh, we add the function called rect mode, like that, rect mode. And then there in all caps, we write the word center. We're using this function saying, hey, I want the square to rotate around or, or to be positioned around its midpoint. So now when you press play, it's right at the very top corner. You see that? Uh, okay, yeah. And the next thing we want to do before we actually draw the square is uh, we want to translate that 0, 0 position um, to <clears throat> a different part of the canvas. And so in order to do that, we need to add a translate function up here before the rotate function. So it okay. looks like this translate and let's say uh 100 comma 100 and then what does the 100 100 mean 
Okay. So we're basically going to put the new uh, the new origin of this sketch, which used to be 0, 0 up here. We're going to place it at oh, the wow. position 100, 100. So basically, we're now determining where the 0, 0 of the canvas is. We're going to move that around. And just as an example, if instead of 100, 100, let's type in mouse x and mouse y. So what this does is it takes the position of your mouse as the location where we will be translating the square. Oh, cool. So it, now it's a capital X and a capital Y. Yeah, now so wherever we, my mouse goes on top of the canvas, it's following. That'll be wherever my mouse is, that'll be the center, essentially, right? Absolutely. It'll yeah, totally. Totally. So now, I mean, in, in a sense, this is now interactive. Mm -hmm. So we are giving it input. Um, now, let's take this background function here and let's remove it because we'll, I want you to cut it out with the command X or a, a, you know, control X key. And then I want you to paste it after the create canvas. So up here, we're going to move the background. Remember, this just runs once at the top inside the setup function. And we took it away out of the draw function so it doesn't replenish every time. So oh. now go ahead and press oh. play. And we, <laughs> yeah, so trippy. exactly. So we have a a thing that's almost acting like a uh, like a drawing tool, right? Um, now let's do something a little bit more interesting here. Let's um, let's fill the cube with um, a different color. So down here where it says square, just before we draw the square, we can say fill, and let's right. say let's give it two five five comma. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. Zero, comma, zero. So we're saying 100% red, 0% blue, uh, green, and 0% blue. And press play. And OK, so now our cubes, uh, our square's red. Oh, nice. And one more thing we want to do is we want to change the color mode to the HSV cycle. So um, here in the background, uh, in the setup function, after the background function, mm -hmm. we want to add a uh, color mode function like that. Color mode. And okay. inside of this one, we're going to write HSV. And so what this is doing is it's basically changing the color style. Instead of it referring to red, green, and blue, it's going to refer to uh, the color wheel, the saturation of the color and the brightness of the color so if you yeah. press play now we have a black square and the reason is because the brightness of the color is zero mm -hmm. so let's move that up to 100 so the so third the value in the fill function is now 100 and now it's white because our saturation value is zero. So that means saturation is how much color do you want this to have? Mm -hmm. We say, we're saying zero, so we want to have zero color. Well, let's change that to full color, so 100. All right, so now it's blue. Now here's where the cool part happens. If we add in a, um, a variable to this one here, let's use the frame count variable like this count now this is a number that's increasing very very fast and so I'm going to use this uh, little cheat in here that's uh, it's called the modulo operator so it's a percentage sign so frame count percentage sign okay. 360 now this is uh, something that's a little bit more uh, advanced in, in terms of understanding so for now, just trust me that what this is going to do is it's going to create almost like a uh, revolving uh, value that goes between 0 and 360, then repeats a 0, and then goes back to 360. Got it. So now if you press play, you're going to see that the colors oh, are... Yeah. Kind of like animating a little bit. Exactly. So they're traveling through that color wheel. Wow. Um, and then one more thing I want to add in here just to make it... Um, a little bit more interactive is we're going to write what's called a, uh, a conditional statement. So down here, after the, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, right after the fill function, but before the square function, okay. right there, 
we're going we're gonna to write if, just like that. So if, and then open and close parentheses. So this is what's going to be a conditional statement. It's going to check if mouse is pressed. I notice how it turns pink. That means you got it right. So mouse, <laughs> all lowercase, all right. I, capital I, lowercase s, capital P, lowercase the rest of it. So mouse is pressed. And then after that, we're going to open up a bracket. So this bracket is like a squiggly bracket. Got it. Okay. And, um, and then anything that happens inside of this bracket and the closing bracket that's going to come next is what's going to execute if the mouse is pressed. So after the square function down here, let's put the closing bracket of that squiggly, the closing squiggly bracket of that conditional if statement. Got it. Okay. So now go ahead and press play, and you're going to see that nothing happens. And why is nothing happening? Well, it's checking to see is if the mouse is pressed. Click anything? Yeah. Exactly. So go ahead and click and hold the mouse down, and now you can basically it becomes um, a, a drawing tool. Maybe I didn't do something. Oh, you know what? I got a syntax. Oh, let's see it. <laughs> um, um, it's so mouse it, is pressed. Do I need a colon somewhere? Is that what? Oh, that is? Uh, I think it's the the closing bracket. Uh, after the square function. So go ahead and add a new line right after the square function and before that other one. Uh, so like line 14 at the end of it, put your cursor there and press enter. And now close the bracket that corresponds to the if statement. So in the closing squiggle bracket. So you'll have okay. two. See how there's one on line 16 and one on line 15. So the one we just added corresponds to the if statement, and the one below it on line 16 corresponds to the draw uh, okay. function. So there's two of them. Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. I got so it. Now give it a shot. OK, so when I click it, then it pops up. So I probably just exactly. click all over the place. Uh, exactly. That's really cool. And, uh, and maybe one more thing we can do here is we can change the size of the, um, of the square. So here we have it set to size 100, but we can change it to something like 50. Uh, it makes the square a little bit smaller, gives us more room. Um, and <clears throat> then that's, uh, so that's pretty much it. So we could refresh one more thing here. We could refresh the background also using a conditional statement. Let's go ahead and do that and then we'll okay. call it there. Yeah. So, Go down uh, maybe just after the, the the closing bracket of your if statement. Okay. So notice how I still I'm still inside the draw loop function. So, okay. So um, like right here, uh, right there, you want to say if. So let's do another conditional statement. If open close bracket. Sometimes I like to draw the brackets before anything, so I know that it's opened and closed. And I'll put in my conditional statement inside there. So if mouse is pressed, once we're going we're to be doing the same check again. So if mouse is pressed, um, we are going to uh, set the background color. So we're going to type in background. And we'll set it back to the uh, the same color we have up here. So background. Uh, actually, let's set the background to white. So that would be zero comma zero comma one hundred. So this this one doesn't matter since this is any color. The second one is uh, the brightness is zero. Uh, I'm sorry, the saturation is zero, so it's all white, and the brightness is one hundred, so fully fully bright. Now, if I press play. Nothing's going to happen because I actually uh, told you the wrong thing to use. So we're saying mouse is pressed, set the background to white. Let's change this to key is pressed. So now whenever a key on the keyboard is pressed, it's going to refresh the background. So I... go ahead and oh. draw. So go ahead and draw some squares oh, okay. on your screen. And then once you you know you let go of the mouse and nothing happens there, and then to refresh the background, just press any key on your keyboard. Oh wow, it's like completely clears it out. Yep, clears it out. Wow, this is really cool. <laughs>
Yeah. So I'm going to go like on a deep dive now. (laughs) This is, uh, you know, the, the basics of, um, creative code here. So we're just, we're using these, um, these predetermined functions. So, um, real quick, the, the way, the place that we can find where these functions are defined are, are written is, um, on the P5, uh, P5 page, so p5js.org, and um, you can just see it on my screen so you don't lose your sketch there. But here on the right-hand side, uh, th- this is the, the their official web page. There's a reference link here, and the reference will show us all of the different um, functions and- functions that we can use. So, for wow. example, here's the uh, square that we used. Um, and you'll see how many there are, right? And it's the combination of using these functions with JavaScript and, and some other basic JavaScript, uh, uh, you know, things that would, you, you know, that takes time to learn. But um, it's the combination of these things that create these generative artworks. And this is what makes uh, P5 and processing such uh, excellent tools for artists to use because there's an easy learning curve. It's about looking up what to use, what everything does, how to use it, and then plugging it into your um, into your code sketch. Wow. Right. Okay. That's great. So yeah. So that's that's how, what do you think? Yeah, I'm I'm super excited. I, I just feel like. I know there's a lot of good tutorial videos out there. I know Coding Train, I think, is you know a very popular mm-hmm. one. And yeah, I'm just excited to really kind of just do like a a deep dive into coding and you know just learn from myself. You know the complexity that goes into you know creating these projects because I, I know it's this isn't something you just kind of like learn overnight. I, I feel like a little bit of a professional after you kind of right. like teaching me, but you know obviously. I think just kind of learning, going like you said, look, looking at that catalog of you know functions and learning what mm-hmm. they do and how they mm-hmm. operate, and then I mean, there's just yeah, there's so many different layers to like the ordering yeah. of these, the different colors. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's really cool that you know you sh- you shared you know how to like animate something. You know, you have like a static um, image, how to like kind of like use a function where if you click it, then it erases. I, I think that's yeah, it- it's really fascinating to know that we have the ability to kind of create these, um, you know, different shapes and colors mm-hmm. and, and, you know, pieces of, of art, you know, creating, you know, just using these basic functions. I think it's, yeah, I think it's just really fascinating. So thank you cool. so much for, cool. you know, giving me just the, or not just me, like everyone in the community, just a little bit of uh, some nuggets of information yeah. on how to, you know, code. Abs- I think it's absolutely. Great. So, I, you know, this is a starting point, right? And uh, that's all it takes is just knowing where to start. And once you start digging in, once you start, you know, diving in, um, things just start to fall into place. And before you know it, you're researching what functions to look for and you're looking Mm -hmm. at forums for information and your skills start to grow and then you can do the things you want to do. And, uh, you know, just giving it the time, you're able to produce uh, interesting things. I think that's awesome. That's so cool. Uh, Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Cool. I'm actually curious, you um, you know, for someone that's, new to coding, such as myself, what are some of the resources that you recommend to give people who are like really interested in, you know, all right, starting from the very, very beginning, mm-hmm. like where do you mm-hmm. recommend uh, someone like me start? Um, well, I mean, the coding train is is probably the best resource um, because there's just so much content on there. There's so mm-hmm. many videos and, and Daniel Schiffman does an excellent job of keeping people entertained while they're learning, which is very rare in the world of learning on videos. Um, So that's, that's a good starting point. I mean, there's, there's books, there's other tutorials out there, you know, just honestly, the best place to look is is YouTube, just Google, you know, first time um, P5JS, and you're going to get a whole bunch of information um, out there. So there, there's plenty of resources to, to, to look up. I mean, forums, the, the P5, uh, website with the reference there. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's all it really takes. Now we're doing this in the, in the editor, the P5 editor mm-hmm. online. Um, but there's also ways to do this on your local computer. So it's not connected to the internet and you can, um, you know, like do stuff offline. Um, you know, and that's a little bit more advanced, like setting up a, your own server and, um, installing your own, uh, uh, environment like you know setting up your own library in there um 
those, those sorts of things are a little bit more advanced, but there's t tons of tutorials out there and um, you know, that would be the logical next step. But for now, the editor provides everything you need. It's online, it's free. Uh, there's tons of tutorials, the information's out there, right? So this is, I think, the place to begin. Definitely, right here. cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I know obviously there's a wealth of resource with all the different artists, you know, at different levels on the mm -hmm. Artblocks Discord. Oh yeah, that so. too. That's Absolutely. definitely, maybe not like the beginning stages because I know like a lot, I think a lot of that can be, you know, learned, like you said, through some of these tutorial videos, but you know, when you get into a little bit more of the complexity of mm -hmm. coding, I think, yeah, I think a lot of these, the artists that we have on the platform are, you know, be super helpful to mm -hmm. kind of reach out to. So definitely, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for, you know, providing us some information about how to, how, how learning how to code. I think that's super important, especially since, you know, we're in the generative art space and this is, you know, a lot of people are purchasing art and yeah, I think that's so cool. Uh, to kind of touch base a little bit back on, you know, the history of generative art, I know there is a channel on the Artblox Discord that I think mm -hmm. is a great resource and Definitely. especially in the pinned messages. Can you talk maybe just briefly on that? Yeah, like sure, sure. Um, so the, the Gen Art History channel is um, on, on Discord is, uh, it's just a place where People like to post, uh, including myself. Um, most of the content on there, I would say, is about the history of, you know, <laughs> the history of generative art. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes a discussion goes into um, more, uh, you know, uh, re related topics like um, certain movements or um, particular styles or, or topics of aesthetics or, you know, like how do you define generative art? Like, what does that even mean? Is is um, you know it, it, does it have to be a computer based? Does it have to be algorithm based? Does it um, can something else be generative or, or you know like who is the artist? Is it the computer? Is it is it the the artist itself? Is the artwork the algorithm? Is the artwork the the image you're looking at? Is it live on the blockchain? Like what is the blockchain? You know like yeah. all these topics <laughs> that sort of relate to questions that. Um, that enrich our understanding of um, of the medium of what we're experiencing together on our blocks and other platforms. Um, just, you know, that's sort of the stuff that kind of gets posted there. Um, I like to uh, go and search for uh, documents or like uh, papers written by either artists or uh, scientific, uh, you know, computer scientists. Um, and I like to share them on there. I, I tend to do my research on like uh, academic uh, live, you know, portal websites, um, like JSTOR. And there's a wealth of like, of information that's been published in journals. It's been, um, uh, well documented that, uh, is a, it's a great information resource. And I like to search those out and post them there. Um, but it's just a, a place to kind of learn about what we're going through, uh, where it came from, uh, giving it its light of day because it very much deserves it. Um, and just, uh, you know, things like that. Great. That's awesome. And then how can people reach you? You know, maybe they want to reach out to you. Maybe they have a question about, you know, something about the generative or the history of generative art, or just, you know, maybe your artwork in general, like do you, totally. can you just mentioned the Twitter and, you know, I know you have your own channel on, uh, on the Artbox Discord as well. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a Twitter page, so it's just, um, it's Doc Caldera at, or at Doc Caldera. Uh, but um, I, th I think the name on there is uh, Dan Dan DCA. Uh, that's what I go by on uh, Discord. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> perfect timing, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm actually at the library right now. So, yeah. I know. Um, <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Well, yeah. So, so yeah. I, I you can find me on Twitter. Find me on Discord. Send me a message. Send me a DM. Post uh, publicly on my channel or in the art in the Gen Art History channel. Send me a Twitter message. And all that stuff is all fair game. So, um, great. Anything like that. Okay. Well, thank you again, Daniel Calderon, for joining us on Art Blocks uh, after dinner mints. Uh, just kind of you know cruise through some of the news and notes. Uh, our next curated drop is on Monday, November 29th at 12 p.m. Central. It'll be the project is called Bent by IPP Sketch. More details will be released later on this week. Uh, Artblocks officially turns one year old this week, which is crazy to think about. Uh, the a platform officially officially launched on Black Friday of last year. So uh, 
to kind of add on to that, I know we do generally our squiggle giveaway after, you know, we kind of talk with our guests. Uh, that will actually be held on Saturday, November 27th at 12 p.m. Central. Um, I'll provide more information on the Discord, or you can just shoot me, you know, a message on Discord or just at Ponyo, and I'll, I'll get to you and provide you information on, uh, on uh, how to enter in for the school giveaway this week to celebrate our one-year anniversary. And to kind of close things out, make sure you subscribe to our weekly newsletter. I included a link in the YouTube description of this video. If you haven't already done so, I highly recommend do it immediately just because we are going to be celebrating our one-year anniversary. There will be a special edition one-year Art Blocks anniversary PO app available, which will have a crazy supply. So we're not going to limit to, you know, like first hundred or whatever. There's going to be a ton of these available. It'll be available all weekend long, so on Saturday and Sunday of this week to everyone in our community. And again, I want to thank Daniel Calderon, a.k.a. Dan Dan, for joining me on Art Blocks After Dinner Mints. Make sure you comment, like, and subscribe to the Art Blocks YouTube channel. Be kind to each other. Buy what you love. Set up a hardware wallet if you haven't done so already. And we will see you all next week. Thanks, Dan. Thank you so much. It was awesome. Yeah, appreciate really, really it. appreciate you. Have a great night. Cool. You too. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.